If you're taking things personally, you're going to defend when the horse defends. Now, if the horse is getting defensive and you're getting defensive, that usually means we're going into battle and that usually means things are going to come wrong, go, go wrong. Don't take it personally. Try and help him. Rather than judge the horse for what he's doing, try and help the horse in what he's doing. Hello again, everybody. Fear, flight, stress, cause of many problems. Probably enemy number one when it comes to training horses. Enemy number two might be resistance or defenses, but enemy number one is fear and stress. And sometimes it's the fear and the stress that's causing the, the resistance and the, and the defenses and the conflict behaviors. So how would you go about reducing that? I suppose the first thing to think about would be, am I taking care of my horse's needs? Am I allowing my horse to have movement? Is he able to walk? Am I keeping him too much in small spaces? Is he able to move? Is he getting social interaction with other horses? And is he eating enough fiber and not uh, too much high energy grain supplements and those kind of things? Way too many horses over here in Europe overfed, overbred and underworked and people think well the horse has got a, a behavior problem. Well he's overfed, overbred, no underworked so <clears throat> that would be the first thing to fix up. You know am I gonna have I bought myself a Formula One that I don't know how to drive and am I feeding him too much high energy octane and is he, is he moving enough? Is he able to use the energy? So am I taking care of that? And the other thing would come back to the education of your horse and how, how I would be educating the horse. First thing I'd be probably trying to do would be do some desensitizing work and just make sure the horse isn't frightened of things. Can you throw the lead rope all around your horse without him moving his feet? Are you able to move a flag around the horse? Don't need to buy a flash one, just put a rag on the end of a stick. Can I rub the horse all over and move it around over his... Can I move the flag there where I put people? If you can't move a stick and a flag, where you put people, you probably shouldn't get on. If Mr. Flag can't ride the horse, Andy's not getting on either. So if I can't move a flag around the horse, especially there where the person's going to sit, I probably wouldn't get on it. And people are riding horses that you can't even move your hand rapidly around without the horse jumping away. And people are getting on these horses and then wondering why it's all coming undone and they're ending up on the ground. So making sure that there already is some decent, removing the hypersensitivity. Some horses, particularly these hot-blooded sport horses, they're very, very sensitive. They get hypersensitive and you'd want to be able to touch those horses all over with a stick, with a whip, and all kind of make sure that those horses aren't moving away from that, that they're not escaping and they're not running away, that they're not having any light fear responses already. Because the thing about fear responses, if they're showing up at a standstill, they're going to get a lot worse at a walk, even worse at a trot, and very, very bad at the canter. So make sure even as you're standing still that the horse is not showing any fear responses. Can I throw the lead rope all over the horse, move a stick around the horse, move my arms, skip, jump, move, uh, wave your hat about, do anything, but just make sure that that horse isn't afraid. And then once you make sure that the horse isn't scared, did you have a confident horse, then make sure you have the control. Do I have control of his feet? Do I have stimulus control over the four basic movements, forwards, backwards, isolate the hindquarters, isolate the forequarters? If I control the horse's feet, the environment doesn't. If I don't control the horse's feet, the environment will. And this is where fear and flight responses are going to click in. So do I have stimulus control over the horse's movement? From there, I'd be training things such as the go and the stop and turn and make sure that they're very well conditioned. Stop is non-negotiable. Stop's not something that you kind of go and stop are two things. If you get really good go and stop, you've already reduced a huge percentage of, con uh, of conflictual behaviors. Now, I don't know exactly why, but if the horse fully understands this is go, this is stop, this is hindquarters, this is forequarters. I haven't tried to fix any problems and I've just fixed the majority of them. Why? Because now I'm controlling the horse's feet. The horse has environmental control because every pressure I put on the horse, he knows how to remove. But he's listening to those pressures and he's not listening to other things. There's a thing called in uh, overshadowing and what it means is while the horse is concentrating on one thing, he can't concentrate on another. So if my horse was getting bothered by something, what I'd be doing is 
keeping his feet busy, moving the hindquarters, moving the forequarters, maybe moving them in a, in a constant movement, hindquarter, forequarter, hindquarter, forequarter, keeping his feet busy. If I'm occupying his feet, I'm occupying his mind. But if I'm not occupying his feet, his mind will be occupied by the environment and now things are going to come undone. Suddenly I'm not the pilot anymore, I've become the passenger and things might go downhill when you're a passenger on a horse. You control what he does with his feet, otherwise the environment will do it for you. So these are all things that can help reduce fear and stress and having the horse having control of his, in, his environment, which means that every pressure that you put on the horse, the horse knows how to remove it. Put some leg on, he speeds his feet up, he knows the legs go away. Put some reins on, might depend what you want. If it was a stop, block your seat, uh, put the pressure on the reins, the horse knows that to remove those pressures, stop his feet. And as soon as he gets the right response, the pressure goes away. The horse feels like he's controlling the pressure, you're putting it on, he's removing it. Now you're having a great communication. You're applying the pressure, the horse knows how to remove it. Everything is clear, everything is understood. You feel like you're controlling the horse, the horse feels like he's controlling the human. Everyone's a happy camper and the horse isn't taken under control by the environment and showing flight response and all sorts of other things. Now I've, taught, I've been thinking about other ways that you might help reduce fear and flight. I've written a few of them down so I'll go through them here. But just making sure that you're not using flight in your training program. Now people often do that without knowing that they're doing it. They might chase their horse around so that he burns off a bit of gas. Uh, I'll try him around, I'll, I'll, I'll chase him around for a while, get him a little bit tired. Well be careful if you're training your horse flight response you're going to regret it later. Trouble is coming. Don't chase your horses. Don't chase them in the round pen. Don't chase them on the end of a lunge line. Some people think, oh, I'm just lunging him. No, you're not. You've got your big whip out there and you're chasing him. Forward is a conditioned response. It isn't a flight response. I'll repeat it because people are getting it wrong. Forward is a conditioned response. There is a stimulus, there is a response, and the stimulus is removed, and the horse learns that that means go forward. Forward is also a conditioned response in the sense that the horse is under self-carriage. He's not taking off and speeding up. You can always take your hands away and the horse maintains rhythm and maintains gait. If he's not, if you take the contact away and the horse starts speeding up, you're in flight response and trouble is coming. So make sure that your horse is in self-carriage. How do you teach self-carriage? You allow the horse to make the mistake and then you fix it and then you allow the horse to make the mistake and then you fix it and the corrections um, wipe out the corrections. That, by that I mean every time I correct the horse and let him make the mistake, I correct the horse, I allow him to make the mistake, I correct the horse, I allow him to make the mistake and by correcting and correcting and correcting pretty soon I'm making less corrections and less and less and less and pretty soon the, the, there's no need to make corrections because the horse isn't making the mistake. But if I don't allow the horse to make the mistake, I don't allow the horse to learn. So what I do then is I'm holding the horse, holding the horse, holding the horse. That situation there will finish badly. You're in a downhill spiral going to crash. So allow the horse to speed up, bring him back into the box and then allow him to speed up again and then bring him back into the box until the horse stays in the box. It's uncomfortable when you leave the box. If he's heading, if he's not holding a line, if he's heading over this way, bring him back into the box. If he's heading over this way, you've got your lateral movements, bring him back into the box. If he's dropping behind the leg, bring him back up into the box and then allow him to make the mistake until the horse understands. You teach the horse, you train the horse how to maintain rhythm and maintain gait. And if you're not doing it, either you'll be pushing the horse to keep going forward or you'll be, if it's a hot horse, you'll be holding him back. And if it's a colder type of horse, you'll be pushing him forward. Now, of course, the horses aren't hotter or colder, but it depends where they come from and the genetic selection and all of those sort of things. The hotter sport horses here in Europe, a lot of people are riding them in maintained flight response, which means the horse is in flight response and they're just holding it back. Now, that is a short term because that, that won't last. It, trouble is coming. It's not going to last. It's going to come undone. Then they'll move into the bigger bit syndrome where they start saying, well, I just have to put a bit bigger bit on because I'm having trouble holding him back. And then a bigger one and then a bigger one. Now the horse is traveling in flight response with pain. The pain is trig triggering a larger flight response. Pretty soon it all falls apart and we have to get another horse. Now you can always change the horse, but if you want to really change how things are going, you might want to change yourself and what you know about the horse and how you train the horse. 
Changing the horse won't change the problem, changing yourself might. And this is why it's so important for humans to want to learn about how horses learn and how horses understand things and how to train the horses, not based on some Disneyland theories, but based on real scientific knowledge. And I know for myself, I'm no scientist, but studying science and learning how horses learn made an enormous difference to my training. It's allowed me to have this beautiful complex over here in France and, uh, and help a lot of the top riders with a lot of problems. Now, what's important is to teach the humans. The humans are the cause of the problems. The horses don't invent problems themselves. So we need to teach people and share this information and therefore the reason for which I'm doing these videos and kicking all these videos out there so that humans can have access to this information and learn better so that they can do better. Now, I've got some other things here that I've been thinking about as far as flight and stress and avoiding all these fear problems that happen. Have you got the horse's movement under stimulus control? Is it under the control of your stimulus, uh, which means different pressure release control? Or is it under the control of the stimulus of the outside environment, in which case you're going to have troubles? You can expose some horses to some pretty nasty environments. We do a lot of indoor work over here, indoor jumping competitions, thousands of people cheering, there's balloons, there's fireworks, there's the speakers, there's the music, there's the whole thing, and those horses walk out there all alone, uh, out of the paddock, out of the warm-up paddock, in front of thousands of people. Now, if they're well-educated, they come out, they do their job, and they walk out of the arena. They walk out of the arena on a loose rein. If they're not, you won't see the horse for long. If he's coming in, he's spinning around, he's bouncing off the walls, he's rearing up, and some rider is trying to pilot that stuff around, and then as he's going out of the arena, he's walking sideways and bouncing off the walls. He, he won't be there very long. Either fix it or he's not going to last. So this is why we need to get a really good foundation on these horses so that they can survive in these environments. Is the horse under your stimulus control or under the stimulus control of the outside environment? Does the ha horse have control of his environment? With every pressure that you put on the horse, does the horse know how to remove it? Does he know how to remove pressure from his mouth? Does he know how to remove pressure from your legs? Does he know how to remove pressure from the whip? Does he know how to remove pressure from the halter? With everything you do, does the horse know? It's not, does the horse know what you want or what is expected of him? He doesn't care about what you want and he doesn't care about what's expected of him. These things aren't important to the horse at all. What's important to the horse is, can I run my own environment? Can I be comfortable? Can I find solutions? Can I improve the situation? What you want and your objectives aren't important to your horse. Now that might hurt your feelings, but that doesn't matter because what matters is, is the horse able to control his environment? He wants to be comfortable for him, probably not for you. So how can I cause it so that the horse knows how to control his environment? When I put pressure on, he knows exactly what response will remove the pressure. I feel like I'm controlling the horse. The horse feels like he's controlling me. Where everything's a win-win situation, everyone's happy. We call that environment the Umwelt in science. Is my horse, does my horse have control of his Umwelt? Am I controlling the horse's feet or is the environment controlling the horse's feet? Do I have the basic movements on the ground? Can I walk the horse forward, stop, walk the horse backwards, control the forequarters, control the hindquarters? Now I could do that at a distance, step the hindquarters over, chase chase them is not a good word, step the hindquarters over a distance. I could also put physical pressure on the horse. I could use both. I could use physical pressure and also an indirect kind of pressure where I'd be pushing the horse at a distance. I could push the horse, I could put pressure on the halter and step the horse backwards. I could also teach the horse to go backwards with a whip or with, with the lead rope. Doesn't matter, but have I taught the horse to go backwards, forwards, hindquarters and forequarters? And I probably have a few different ways of doing that. <laughs> But there would be different ways, different codes that I would put in place so that I can teach the horse backwards, forwards, hindquarters, forequarters, and then I've got the feet under stimulus control. The environment probably won't. <coughs> Am I using opposing or conflictual aids? Sometimes people are holding the horse back while they're pushing the horse forward. Push me, pull you is not a form of equitation that is durable. It's not long term, it won't last, it'll come undone. So are you holding the horse backwards and pushing him forwards at the same time and wondering why he's either blowing out in the back end and starting to kick out or he's rearing up in the front end or he's starting to swerve off left and right. If you're blocking in front and pushing forward, 
he's either going to dive to the left or right, he's going to go up or he's going to kick out, but he can't just stay in that box and be uncomfortable. If you're teaching the horse self-carriage, you're not holding him in the box, you're teaching him to stay in the box. It's very, very different. Imagine the horse in a kind of a rectangle. So the horse is in this rectangle. Now, if he goes too fast forward, there's a, there's a fence in front, and that fence is my hands that say, my seat that blocks and says, now come back into the box. And if the horse is, is going out forward, I let him run into the fence and then bring him back and then release the reins again. And I let him come out and bump into the fence and then bring him back in again. And if he's dropping out the back and not moving off my legs, I'm not going to put my legs on and carry him. I'm going to let him drop out the back of the box, then put my legs on and say, bump back, get back into the box. And sometimes we bounce off the walls a little bit. Doesn't matter, young horse happens a fair bit. And little by little, the box starts to get smaller and the horse learns to stay within it. And if he's coming off to this side, I can bring him back in. And if he goes off this side, I can bring him back in. The horse is between my reins, between my legs, and he's not on flight response, and he's not dropping behind the leg, and he's not, I'm not carrying the horse. I'm not maintaining the responses. I'm teaching the horse to maintain them. Or the other choice is I push the horse forward and I hold the horse back, and I try and hold him in the box. Now, if you're holding the horse in the box, some horses can and will put up with it. I don't know why, and many horses won't, and they're going to blow up, and you're going to get into trouble. So rather than try and maintain responses, rather than try and control the horse, teach the horse, train the horse, rather than try to hold. Very hard for the human, even with big bits and big spurs and all these other things, with these big strong arms, to control a 600 kilogram sport horse. So better off training them teaching them and knowing how they learn. Allow the horse to make the mistake, trial a response, find out that it's not making him comfortable and trial another response and find out that it does. Help your idea to become the horse's idea by making the wrong thing difficult and the right thing easy. It's about, as everyone that knows anything about horsemanship has heard that phrase, have heard those things a million times. Try to cause your idea to become the horse's idea by making the right thing easy and the wrong thing difficult. And if we can just master that and have the feet under control, that's about all we need to know. Of course, very simple to say, it's taken 20 odd years for me to try and understand it, and I've probably still got a little way to go. So, am I avoiding opposing and conflictual aids? Sometimes people are doing it without actually knowing. Uh, sometimes people are maybe crossing over with the outside rein when they're trying to turn or doing it with one hand crossing over here and pulling his mouth off to the right while they're trying to turn to the left. Now that doesn't make any sense to the horse. You can't pull on the right rein to turn to the left and, and think that the horse could possibly understand, particularly if you're using uh, the direct rein off to the left to turn left, the direct rein off to the right to turn right, and then sometimes using the, the outside rein in a pulling way. No reins pull. The, op the direct rein is what we call in French a uh, 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 rein uh, overture, which it means an opening rein. So the, the, the direct rein opens. The opening has nothing to do with pulling. And the outside rein in French is called a rein d'appui, which means it's a pushing rein. Now, pushing doesn't mean pulling either. You can push on the outside, but you can't pull. There is not a rein position that pulls. The hands of the rider don't come back towards his body. They fix, they put on pressure, but they don't pull. So there's opening reins, there's supporting reins, but there aren't any pulling reins. So whether you call it a neck rein, a supporting rein, or whatever you want to call it, it's all the same thing. What they don't do is pull. Now, if you're pulling on the horse's face, the message is probably very unclear to the horse, and you might get stress, and you might get fear, and therefore you might get conflict behaviors. And probably the last thing I'll talk about in this video is don't take things personally. Understand, am I avoiding anthropomorphism? Do I understand that the horse is just a horse, of course, and couldn't be anything else? So he's not doing things wrong on purpose. He wouldn't know how to be. He doesn't know right from wrong and good from bad. <clears throat> he trials responses. He tries to find out <clears throat> excuse me, what works for him and what doesn't. If you're taking things personally, you're going to defend when the horse defends. Now, if the horse is getting defensive and you're getting defensive, that usually means we're going into battle and that usually means things are gonna come wrong, go, go wrong. Don't take it personally, try and help him. Rather than judge the horse for what he's doing, try and help the horse in what he's doing. It, it will change dramatically how you react to the problem. If you say, oh, look at him now, he's being disrespectful. Now you're judging the horse and you're probably gonna go into war.
If you're saying, mm, he's in difficulty, how can I help him? You might react differently. You might interpret the situation in a more scientific or at least a less anthropomorphic way and be able to more adequately help the horse through the problem. Are you there to help the horse? Are you there to train the horse? Are you there to make yourself look good? What are you trying to get done? In the past, used to start quite a lot of horses and I don't really know what the objective was. Was it to get the horse started? Was it to try and start as many as I could? Was it to try and prove that I could? And then one time I thought, well, I've got plenty of time and I'm alone here, so I'll just try and, I'll try and help the horse through this. And suddenly by trying to help the horse, you think, actually, it's not about me anymore. And when it's not about you, it goes better. When it's about you, it goes wrong. It's not about you. It's about the horse. How can I help the horse? Why do I do what I do? Rather than trying to prove anything, just how can I help the horse? And you might find that you react differently and things go better and you don't take things personally and you don't get cranky. And if you understand the situation, the better we understand, the less the less that we're likely. And it was a, it was a, a beautiful phrase that I used to hear often in, in, in the United States, which was uh, violence begins where knowledge runs out or something like that, where, where, where knowledge stops, violence begins, which is exactly right. So if we could learn more, know more, maybe we'd get less frustrated. We get frustrated when we don't know what's going on. I get frustrated with computers. I don't understand them. I'm not very good at that stuff. So that can be frustrating. But if you know horses, you know how they work, not in some anthropomorphic way, but if you know really what's going on as far as the science of learning goes, if you understand learning theory and how to apply it, you will automatically be less frustrated and you won't be going into fight with the horse. If you start getting into fights with your horse, you will, of course, develop stress and fear and think in yourself, but also in your horse. And these things are learned quickly and are difficult for the horse to forget. You don't want to go there. You don't want to do that to the horse. Fear and flight, they are learned in single repetitions, so you don't use it. Now, when you feel the emotions getting out of control, just remind yourself, don't judge the horse, help the horse. How can I help him through this? And you can always take a little break and start over. It's not the end of the world. But think about how can I help him and don't take things personally. It's not about you. The horse is not being bad to make you unhappy. He's not being wrong. He wouldn't know how to be. He's just a little bit lost. Maybe you're not being clear enough. Try and figure out how you can help him through. Interpreting things in that way may require you sometimes to question yourself and say, okay, I'm getting something wrong. And admit that maybe you're not getting it all right. I have to do that only every day. Okay, now how can I get this a little bit better? And in teaching, it's the same thing. Sometimes say, okay, the message isn't getting through. How can I explain this a little bit better? Rather than judging the client or getting frustrated, how can I help you? Same thing with the horse. So these are things you might want to think about because a lot of times people know what they should do, but they just lose control of their emotions. Now, I've said it quite a few times. If you control your horse's feet, the environment won't do it for you. If you control your emotions, the environment won't do it for you. If you control your brain, the environment won't do it for you. So are you the pilot or are you the passenger? You're better off being the pilot of your brain and the pilot of your emotions and the pilot of your horse because otherwise you'll become the passenger of these things and usually it won't take you down the right track. There are a few things that you might want to think about quite a lot in all these videos. I hope you've been enjoying all this. I hope you're learning a bunch. I know some of them are a bit long. Most people won't take the time it takes to learn it. That's why most people don't become great horsemen. But thank you for watching these videos. I appreciate it. And absolutely more importantly than that, I'm sure your horse does. We'll see you again for some more videos soon.